Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Raj Basord. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in private practice in Harley Street, London, and I'm delighted to be joined today for this podcast by John Quiggin, who is the author of a fascinating new book entitled Economics in Two Lessons, Why Markets Work So Well and Why They Can Fail So Badly. Uh, John Quiggin is the Vice Chancellor Senior Fellow in Economics at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. His previous book, Zombie Economics, How Dead Ideas Still Walk Among Us, published by Princeton, has been translated into eight languages. He's written for the New York Times and The Economist, amongst other publications, and is a frequent blogger for Crooked Timber and on his own website, www.johnquiggin.com. So, John, one of the arguments you mount in your book is the very nature of what economics is at its heart may be understood, misunderstood by economists themselves. So what's your proposition as to what econo- economics is really all about? I think the central idea is what's called opportunity cost. And that's uh, uh, the idea that uh, the cost of something isn't necessarily measured in, in monetary terms, but in terms of what you have to give up to have it. And that's, I think... Uh, the key idea we need to think about in public policy uh, and also in applying economics uh, in in uh, uh, our individual decisions and business decisions. So if I can use an analogy, and of course you can must correct me if I've got this wrong, um, I, I'm going to use an example that comes from my own life. I'm a classic car fan. There's a classic mm. car for sale, let's say, for £10,000. I'm thinking the cost of the car is £10,000. I can afford it. I'll buy it. However... An economist might say, thinking about opportunity costs, if instead of spending the £10,000 on the car, I invested it wisely, and in a few years' time, my £10,000 became £100,000, the real cost of the car is closer to something like £100,000 because of the opportunity cost. Is that kind of the Mm. idea here? Certainly, if you had that investment opportunity available and uh, and couldn't have both, that, that is the opportunity cost. So it's the best available option best alternative option to you. And certainly very typically, uh, there's a, an opportunity cost between spending money now, uh, saving and investing it and spending it later. Uh, typically, you can get more uh, in the future than you can in the present. Uh, and that opportunity cost is reflected in interest rates and so forth. So, so the choice between having something now and having something later is, is a classic example of opportunity cost. But torturing my example a little bit further, if I drive around in my classic car and I pollute the environment and the pollution causes the polar ice caps to melt and it actually costs governments a million pounds to fix the mm. problem of each car in terms of its pollution, the real opportunity cost to society of me buying that car is £100,000 or, or a million pounds and... And that, that's an externality, another key concept in the book. Yes. And markets don't price that in to the price of the car. And that's, that's the central problem. That's exactly right. So the first lesson says when markets are working well, the, the price of the car is indeed, uh, the, mar- the monetary price of the car is indeed a good reflection of the opportunity cost. But when you have problems like externalities, market prices don't reflect opportunity costs. And, and that's the second lesson that uh, after we understand First, how well markets work, that in fact gives us a better understanding of why they fail in certain circumstances. So I would have thought, and again, you must correct me if I'm wrong, that the free market economists who believe in one lesson economics, there is only one lesson, which is that free markets Mm. are the best way for a society to run, um, would say that as we, as the polar ice caps start to melt and it it becomes clear that we've hit a crisis and, and it's, and we need to fix it, the free market will step in, technology will step in and fix it because the, the market will see a pricing opportunity or a profit opportunity in fixing the polar ice caps. So we can still leave it to the market. Is that not what the free marketeers will argue? Well, I think um, the free marketeers are divided among themselves. So the coherent position, which which is to say, is that if we create the right kinds of property rights, for example, uh, carbon uh, emission permits, as, as we have in the EU, uh, then market incentives will indeed want to to fix that, created those property rights, uh, uh, the market will fix the problem. And that's indeed the kind of position I argue in the book. But uh, an important part of the point is what this illustrates is there isn't just one possible set of prices out there. What prices you have depend on what property rights and what, uh, what kinds of social structures you have. And a lot of free market economists have been unwilling to confront that face on. So they've been unwilling to 
except the government, the property rights of all kinds are created by government, uh, seeing one created in real time, like emissions trading schemes, is something they don't like. And so they've resorted, for example, to climate denial or, or to uh, fallacious arguments uh, to suggest that the market will fix things even without a price. And I had never seen that before. There seems to be a natural link, therefore, bef- between climate deniers and an embracement of uh, an embracing of the free market. And I hadn't seen that link before, but that comes through from your book. It does. And oddly enough, uh, Bastia, the 19th century economist who um, uh, whose inspiration for the book I'm criticising, actually has an amateur exercise in climate science denial even before the time. So it's, it's quite odd that... Um, uh, uh, that there was no reason why well, really it wasn't an issue or anything, but uh, he, he raises this issue. So I, I mentioned that in the book. But yes, you do see a significant group of, uh, among you know, among economists, the majority support uh, a pricing scheme, the majority of both free market economists or moderately free market economists and more interventionists. But uh, there is a significant group, uh, a significant group who don't want to see new property rights created because that, that the property rights are created by government and have therefore resorted to science denial. Now, um, given that your argument in the book is that opportunity cost, this concept is very important and lies at the heart of economics, it is also interesting that you are saying that economists themselves are very poor or often poor at calculating opportunity costs. And you give a very interesting uh, and humorous example almost about um, uh, Bob Dylan concert tickets, uh, an experiment that was done amongst economists attending a very important conference of, I think, the American Economic Association, and they failed in um, two different sets of tickets and they yes. they fail to understand the opportunity cost of choosing one over the other in terms of when they're asked what the opportunity cost of 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 uh, taking the bob dylan ticket is they get the calculation wrong which, which is very interesting i mean a, a proportion get it right but only a small yes. minority get it right so what's really interesting is that economists mm. themselves are poor at calculating um opportunity cost that, that's often correct you, you certainly see lots of arguments made by professional economists who don't pay enough attention to opportunity costs and and uh, really it's a concept that isn't emphasised nearly enough in the training of economists. If we move straight on to the technicalities of supply and demand, uh, what will happen to prices when you impose a tax and so forth, uh, not enough reasoning about, about where the opportunity costs are and what the relationships are between opportunity costs and market prices. But the thing that I didn't quite understand is that the, the cost of a car is the cost of a car. For me to try and figure out what else I could have done with that money or what the implications are of owning the car and the pollution costs and so on becomes a little bit of an act of the imagination, it seems to me. It becomes almost philosophical. And that's why I I can see why opportunity costs are difficult to work out and therefore naturally tend to get neglected. And what's interesting is you're saying they're the crucial thing. They're the thing we should devote more resources to figuring out. Uh, What's your response to that point? Yes, it is. It is difficult because, of course, uh, if you have ten thousand pounds, there's many different things you could do with it, and uh, the opportunity cost is uh, the best of those things, other than buying the car. If if the best of those things is better than the car, then obviously that's what you should do. If it isn't, uh, then that that is the opportunity cost of, uh, of the car. So um, it certainly is. It certainly is a concept which gets skated over and which uh, which. Uh, requires, I think, just lots of practice thinking about it, trying to think what are the opportunity costs here uh, to, to get the idea. You can learn the definition pretty quickly. You can learn to do exercises like concert tickets, but uh, to really think about it consistently is, is a challenge. But I think what's also interesting is that it's actually a key psychological and almost psychiatric concept. I would argue that in therapy, often what you're trying to do, let's say a wife is staying with a husband mm. who's beating her up mm. on a daily basis and she's too frightened to leave. Therapy is really about trying to get her to see the opportunity costs of staying in, exactly. an, in an abusive relationship as opposed to her alternative options. And at the heart of many dysfunctional much dysfunctional human behaviour is an inability either to think about opportunity costs or, or a dysfunctional approach to it. Well, certainly, if, and that conceiving that alternative is is very challenging. In fact, I'm doing some interesting work with uh, a philosopher, L.A. Paul, on uh, on precisely these kinds of transformative decisions, how difficult they are, how difficult it is to envisage being out of your uh, current uh, abusive relationship 
for example, out in the world, you need, uh, as you say, a real exercise of the imagination uh, to conceive of that and therefore to bring the opportunity cost to bear uh, in a decision to stay or go. Now, you point out that some economists who've won the Nobel Prize have had diametrically opposite views to other economists who've also won the Nobel Prize, often quite closely together in terms of the years apart of each other. So how do you explain that? Because economics and economists are trying to argue they're a science you don't get physicists winning the Nobel Prize who have diametrically opposite views to each other. So you how don't. do you explain that? I, I guess I, I think our the profession's claims to be a science are, are overstated. I think uh, on uh, on some things we, we have uh, a pretty good understanding and, and a very general agreement. Uh, on other things, particularly the big questions of macroeconomics, uh, what will happen, for example, if, if governments uh, uh, increase public spending without raising taxes, what will happen then? Uh, there are just very widely dispersed views, and obviously, uh, obviously, these are important questions, and we have to do our best. Uh, but I think it's it's a mistake to think that the profession has reached the kind of scientific stage that uh, we like to think. And in fact, in some ways, the institution of the Nobel Prize uh, was an, an attempt to claim that scientific authority uh, in the context of uh, political debates in Scandinavia uh, to to raise the prestige of, of economics, so that. Uh, economists could speak with the kind of authority they wanted to. Now, um, your book is in, entitled Economics in One Lesson, but with the one lesson uh, phrase crossed out and instead the words two lessons inserted as a scribble. Uh, so, first of all, where does the idea that there's only one lesson in economics come from? Well, it comes from a book called Economics in One Lesson, published it just after World War II, and, um, which is still in print, still selling, uh, which, of, which essentially puts that idea... Uh, not, I think, as clearly as it might. I think, in fact, I I improved the one lesson in my version, but, but he basically, this is by Henry Hazlitt, he basically looks at institute, looks at cases where, for example, people say the government ought to provide some good or service and says we need to think about the opportunity cost of that, that if we do this, we either have to not do something else or increase taxes. And so he has a lot of, uh, lot of examples. These, in turn, are derived from Bastiat, the great 19th century French economist who really, again, prefigured this idea of opportunity cost. So your book is a response to the idea that there's only one lesson. And I think you quote a famous economist who said, if anyone tells you there's only one lesson, go back for the second lesson. So what's the second lesson in economics? So I impute to to Hazlitt the lesson that market prices tell us about opportunity costs and provided markets are working correctly, that's true. But as we talked about with externalities, uh, that's not the case. Uh, even more so when we have mass unemployment, which is is a distressingly regular feature of life in a market system, uh, we have this massive gap between uh, the wage people would be willing to work for uh, and the availability of uh, the availability of of that work. So that uh, lots of people are willing and able to work at the prevailing wage and who could be productive aren't employed because the market system is broken down in one way or another. Uh, so it's a massive failure of that, that first lesson. And the final point, which we already touched on, is that Hazlitt sort of assumes that uh, the kind of standard property rights we have, we know about, uh, you know, personal uh, personal ownership of things, uh, stocks and shares and so forth, are the kind of equilibrium that would, would result if we just let those things uh, be unfettered by government impositions, that that's uniquely right. But as we've seen with the creation of property rights for emissions, there's many different possible starting points, many different possible sets of property rights we could start with. Each of them produces a different set of prices and a different set of allocation. So that second lesson says, uh, sure, when when we have everything going right, uh, market prices will tell us about opportunity costs. But unless government is in there doing its job in lots of different ways, I will be far away from that, and market prices won't reflect opportunity. Now, again, as I understand it, Hazlitt's book is a response to Keynesian economics. Uh, Keynes is a famous economist who seems to rescue the West uh, from uh, the, the Great Depression of the 1930s with the idea, and he, he 
describes it very graphically, that the government should step in and and um, do something to to produce more business confidence. Uh, and that's, again, an interestingly profoundly psychological idea. And that um, his idea was that the government has to reflate by pumping money into the economy. He gives a graphic example of mm. burying money in mm. disused coal mines and let people go and dig up the money. Um, and it's a, it's a it's meant to be a bizarre yes. example to make the point that it really doesn't matter how you inject money into the system, but if you inject money, you reintroduce confidence, and then and then factories will open again, and and, and workers will start getting jobs again. That's correct. And of course, I mean Keynes's book was called the General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, and his point was that the theory that prevailed until um, uh, until he wrote was one in which the economy. Uh, is normally at full employment, and that's what the theory is about. Uh, it really doesn't have, it, it treats uh, depression, slumps, and so forth as periodic interruptions, which really the theory doesn't cover. Uh, yeah, they're just a special case. They're just the case the theory doesn't cover, and there's nothing to be done about them but wipe them out. And um, uh, so Keynes says no, when the, uh, when, uh, the crucial point is that uh, in terms of opportunity cost, although he doesn't express it this way, the people who are going out digging up the money were sitting at home doing nothing before. So the opportunity cost of the effort they put into it uh, is zero. And when they go out and spend money on, on, if the government instead spends money on actual goods and services, things like health and education, uh, we get we get useful outputs uh, at an opportunity cost, which is far less than it would be if the economy was at full employment and we were shifting resources from one activity to another. Okay, so um, Hazlitt's book is a response uh, to the Keynesian idea, um, and and why why was it that there was felt to be a need to respond to Keynes? After all, Keynes had saved the West. Oh, well, he saved the West, but he had he had saved in a way that uh, that destroyed a, a, a faith in pure free markets. So Hazlitt want Hazlitt uh, wanted to go back to uh, you know, the pre-Keynesian, you know, really pre-World War I, because the economy had been a, a mess for most of that time, uh, to put that orthodoxy of free markets. And so Keynes saved capitalism, but at the cost of a much greater role for government, and that's what Hazlitt was opposing. Now, another very interesting part in your book is this point you make about the fact that recessions are a hell of a lot more common than people seem to realise, particularly free market economists. Mm. And they, 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 they actually almost creep up to being close to the majority or 50 percent of the time and also they're inevitable you're, you're kind of a bit of a pessimist about the inevitability of recessions they're not accidental random things that just seem to happen to come along they're embedded within the system could you explain that well first yes i mean obviously the i I'm, the book is largely written for us audience so i look at the um look at the data from the national bureau of economic research which it has a, a definition of recessions oh sorry what it does is it has a, a committee which after the fact says, yes, a recession started at such and such a time, and then um, uh, and then uh, again after the fact says the recession is now over. And so I looked at those numbers, and, and what you see is uh, very regular recessions uh, from, from the, uh, through the late 19th century up to, uh, up to the Great War. Uh, of course, then um, uh, the huge depression in the 1930s, uh, then the brief period from uh, 1945 to 1970 when uh, recessions were yeah, relatively rare and brief and uh, Keynesian policies were in operation. When the Keynesian policies stopped working for various reasons, we go back to um, uh, go back to more regular recessions. And, of course, um, uh, the whole period well, from, from the global financial crisis, we really had a period of slump which we went uh, essentially all through the... Uh, life of the Obama administration just very slowly recovering uh, and of course in Europe still not by no means completely recovered. So these recessions are very common and um, and clearly uh, uh, yeah, there was a belief which I criticised in my zombie economics book that financial deregulation and clever central banks had put, put them to bed that we wouldn't see them again and this idea was just becoming at its peak of popularity when the global financial crisis came along. But I still don't understand why your argument is they're kind of inevitable. They're embedded within the system and they're going to be very common as opposed to occasional blips. Well, uh, uh, part of the problem is they last a long time. If they, I think there's really two kinds we see. One is when governments are intervening, they can overdo it um, in terms of contracting monetary policy. Those are inevitable because mistakes are made. 
uh, and what you see is uh, uh, you can get quite significant recessions. But the really, if you leave things to run by themselves, sooner or later uh, you get these financial crises. And I don't really talk so much about that in this book, but um, there's a great uh, economist, Hyman Minsky, who sort of gives the idea that uh, if you have this, if you have an unregulated financial system or a lightly regulated financial system, uh, and you have a long period when get, making money is easy, the quality of uh, uh, the quality of lending gradually declines. More and more bad practices emerge, and then you have this. Um, then you have a severe crisis of, uh, yeah, in the financial system, and those take a very long time to recover from. Okay, so um, the other point that you make in the book is that the power of one lesson e- economics, um, as embodied by a famous economist Hayek, is the notion that prices in a free market convey valuable information, which you're not going to get. Uh, in a government-run, regulated, centrally planned system. The failure of central planning is the failure to to, Mm. to appreciate the information that millions of consumers and producers have. Um, So could you explain this idea of prices as information? Yeah, so if we think of uh, Hayek, I think, gives an example of of, um, somebody who's who's buying copper, for example. They might be using it to make, um, make plumbing equipment of some kind. The price of copper... Uh, goes up and down, and that's because new mines are discovered somewhere or uh, the civil strife in one of the source countries, or perhaps uh, uh, a new new source of demand like uh, computers comes along. All of these things all of these things mean that copper becomes more or less uh, scarce. Uh, now, now, the person deciding whether to use copper rather than, um, say, plastic for their pipes doesn't need to know any of this. They don't need to know why it is that... Uh, why it is that copper is uh, uh, copper has become expensive? All they need to know is uh, obviously uh, it's dear. I th- think in this case I'll use uh, uh, use uh, plastic piping rather than rather than copper, uh, and that in turn means that the copper they would have bought is available perhaps for an alternative higher value demand like wiring for computers. So if we go to a centrally planned system like the British, uh, the UK National Health Service, um, economists would predict that you're going to have problems because of this problem to do with the, the lack of pricing within the system to convey information. That some some bureaucrat sitting in Whitehall mm. having to make decisions about the number of doctors the UK needs and all the other big decisions are going to make poorer decisions than a free market. Is that right? Well, poor decisions than a properly functioning free market, I guess. And that's, I mean, health is one of these areas where uh, nothing works very well. There are all sorts of reasons why market prices don't give the right signals. Um, Once you have insurance in the system, for example, uh, insured patients don't have uh, any more than with the NHS. If you have a market insurance system, uh, patients just go to the doctor without worrying about the cost of it because they're covered by insurance. Uh, there's, all, there's a lot of difficulties about um, uh, about uh, the incentives you provide for the providers if, that uh, if you get providers focus too much on incentives, they gain the system and uh, and create all sorts of problems. So it, so it's a situation where uh, it really is the second lesson that that um, uh, markets don't work uh, uh, certainly don't work well across the board, as you can see from from the US system, which also has, still has plenty of intervention in it. Uh, so in some sense, you're bound to have governments playing a fairly large role, but that doesn't mean that you can't potentially uh, potentially use pricing pricing mechanisms within the system to improve decision making uh, where where uh, where the um, where people are really sending signals about what resources are valuable to them. And um, there's a part of your book where you discuss the notion of the mixed economy and the idea Mm. in the mixed economy is that certain things are better served by a properly functioning free market, but certain other things are better served by government intervention or or governments being very involved in either providing or or, um, uh, running it, like education and health. Why why is our education and health both things that that are not run so well by the free market? Well, I'll I'll just stop here and that will stop. Um, so, uh, th- firstly, there's services that uh, consumers don't have uh, the kind of appreciation of what what they need and want that, that we normally assume. If you want to buy a car, we assume you know what kinds of features you want in the car. Um, with uh, 
you know, you, you, you know the, whether you want a fast car or, or one that has plenty of capacity, all of these kinds of things. So having the government try and work out what car you want would be a very bad idea. When you're uh, you know, a, a young person seeking education, you know in general that education is a good thing. The whole point is you don't know what it is, what it is that that education should constitute. Similarly, patients don't have a good idea uh, when they go to the doctor. They don't say, well, I need unless they've been at Google too much, they don't say, uh, I need such and such a medication, this is my condition. Uh, they say, I'm feeling bad and I want you to make me better. So, so the first thing is that we don't have much value from the consumer side. The second thing is that uh, the nature of the expenses in the case of education, uh, education is uh, primarily given to the young, primarily consumed by the young, who of course don't have the resources to pay for it themselves and frequently as parents don't. Uh, They'll get earnings in the future, which can be taxed, but, yeah, but that funding problem is there. Similar case of health, what you have is uh, potentially huge expenses occurring unpredictably. That entails the need for insurance, uh, which has to be either publicly or privately provided. And there are all sorts of problems with private insurance. So these kinds of the combination of uh, a lack of consumer sovereignty, a need for professionalism on the part of providers, what we've seen is that for-profit education has been a disaster because it's very easy to very easy to uh, give give a substandard product because people don't know what they're getting. And similarly, although there's more, probably more of a role for profit in the health in the health uh, sector, uh, nonetheless, we rely very much on the assumption that uh, the doctor isn't out to maximise their profit at our expense in the manner of a car salesman. Uh, that the doctor is actually looking out for us. So um, thank you very much for talking to us today. One final question. On an average day-to-day -day basis, if we take this idea that opportunity cost is incredibly important, how do you see ordinary people embracing this idea and how do you see that making a difference to their lives? Um, and how would it improve their lives if they put opportunity costs more at the centre of their decision-making? Well, I think uh, there are ap particular applications like uh, what's called sunk costs, and that is... Uh, supposing you've spent a lot of money on something um, and you're now, but yeah, it's not working. So you got, say, a car, you've spent a lot of money on it uh, and then now you want to decide whether to keep it or scrap it. Uh, it's important to say, well, really, uh, the money you've spent is gone. The opportunity cost of, uh, the opportunity cost of, um, of uh, going to, uh, of, say, buying a, a new car is the residual value of the car, not the money you spent on it. So, so what, it, what the opportunity cost of scrapping the car is what it's, what it's worth now, not uh, uh, not what you spent on it. And so this idea of sunk cost where people say, look, I've spent so much on this, I really need to continue, uh, is, um, is generally problematic. Now, there are sometimes psychological reasons why you might want to do that, but you need to be aware of what you're doing. Uh, and there's a reverse fallacy, which is where you say, uh, look, no matter what, what I do, this car is going to be a loser, so I won't won't spend a small amount of money to fix it up uh, uh, because I'll still still end up behind. So, opportunity cost is focus on what your actual alternatives are now. Uh, not what you did or might have done in the past. So an example of that in psychotherapy or psychology, which we see quite a lot, would be people stay in a relationship which really isn't working for them because mm. they believe they've invested 25 years into this marriage, they'll say. So yes. that's why they don't want to leave. But what you would say if you're using an economist's hat or brain is forget the past. Mm. The issue is yes. your emotional resources are better spent invested in someone else who's going to cherish you better than the current abusive relationship you're in. Is that roughly speaking? And it, well, I, I mentioned precisely that example in the book, in fact, um, that uh, you have to decide whether to continue, whether to continue on uh, in a relationship and, uh, and you, need to, uh, you need to look ahead. Of course, there's a whole lot of psychological factors going into it, but certainly you certainly need to look ahead and say, you know, how, what is the best choice for me in my life uh, in the future, uh, not... What cho yeah, not what choices should I have made in the past? There, there is a sense in which some opportunity costs are so massive. When patients go to see doctors, mm. the, 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 the point you're making about choosing a good doctor in a free market system, mm. or if you're in a state system, you don't get a choice, you get mm. allocated a doctor. Mm. Um, the, the, the psychological problem of thinking about the possibility, if you thought too hard about it, that your doctor may not be that good, and therefore mm. you may be getting poor treatment, and that's a massive opportunity cost, like including death and stuff, yes. if you have poor medicine. I think people 
people get frozen um, psychologically and, and are in a kind of denial. They don't want to think about those things because they're too horrible to think about or they're too stressful. Is there a sense in which there's a psychological dimension to thinking about opportunity cost? It's just too stressful for a lot of people, so that's why they don't do it. It certainly can be, I think. And, and I've been looking at the, you know, that issue. Um, there's quite strong resistance, for example, to publishing statistics on hospital performance and so forth. Everyone knows that some doctors are better than others, but uh, no one's, you know, at a policy level, uh, no one's willing to contemplate very much um, at the issue of well, what happens if we publicise this fact. And, and of course, I mean, there are practical arguments like um, uh, you might have somebody who loses half their patients because they're the best doctor and they get the, the most critical cases and only they, no, no one else would do as, do as well. So there are there are reasons for querying publication of statistics, but also I think very much a, a discomfort with the idea of, uh, look, yeah, you know, you know, if I can't get the good doctor, my survival chances are, are much worse than if I could. Oh, John, are you still there? Uh, I am. Yeah, yes, yeah. we might have had a little break. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so one, one final thing. Um, uh, the the economics and psychology and psychiatry are very similar in that that these are these are subjects that are at the heart of everyday life. People often are not professional and they haven't studied the subject formally. So they're kind of amateur. Mm. Everyone's an amateur mm. economist, yes. just like everyone's an amateur psychologist or psychiatrist. And you guys suffer from the same problem that we suffer from, which is the armchair expert. Yes, that, that people believe they're expert when they're not. And you see this particularly in your field with politicians and so on. Mm. So how do you guys cope psychologically with the stress of seeing economic illiteracy all around you? I, I guess it's a more general problem. I mean, I, I suppose, speaking personally, early in life, I worked out that um, our competence wasn't that common. And I suppose uh, I have, have plenty of examples of my own incompetence. So I always took the view, if I did something wrong, and the system, the back, there's usually a backup system in society, if that actually worked as intended and bailed me out, I felt very lucky, because the, what, I, what I expected is if I did something wrong, the person who was supposed to protect me would also screw things up <laughs> and I'd be in a hole. But so, so I think you just have to accept that um, uh, people aren't, uh, aren't super rational. I suppose there's one group of economists who invent elaborate theories in which everybody's behaving rationally and their failure to do their job is, is a rational decision and so they're very committed to this hyper-rational notion. But uh, I'm not in that group. But the key take-home lesson is that there's certain subjects... Physics, for example, isn't one of them, uh, but economics mm. and psychology and psychiatry are some of them, which we should constantly be interested in educating ourselves in, because it, mm. it will lead us to be more skillful at life. Um, and and um, your your book is, is a is a wonderful contribution yes. in an attempt to try to explain to the to the to non economists key concepts that they need. But but within the field of economics, as in within the field of psychology and psychiatry, people who try to popularize a subject or explain it to the public are often viewed with suspicion when it's actually an essential task. Yes, I mean, it, it, it varies, but uh, certainly I think I've been the, indeed the popularity of popularisation varies a bit, but certainly I think um, looking at the reaction to my yeah, this book and my previous book, there's certainly a group of people, I think, well, who have, I think, uh, typically people who have at great effort acquired technical mastery of of uh, the technical parts of economics, but don't really, in my view, often have a, a very good understanding of things like opportunity cost. We feel very much threatened by the idea that um, the idea that uh, you can popularise this stuff. We're very much invested in the idea that, you know, the, the five years they spent in graduate school learning this has set them apart from the rest of the population. Well, John Quiggin, it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us. The title of the book again is Economics in Two Lessons, Why Markets Work So Well and Why They Can Fail So Badly, published by Princeton University Press. John, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.